you, Carrie Fuji, for being a guest on this episode of Flute Unscripted, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Uh, you're a Senkyo artist, uh, a prize-winning soloist, educator, <laughs> philanthropist. Um, you're truly inspiring and a great example, I think, to all flutists out there um, on what it, it truly means to give back. Um, oh. Before we kind of delve into a lot of the work you're doing, your um, multifaceted career and your nonprofit organization, Music Beyond, I did want to go back a little bit and talk more about your childhood in Tokyo and um, learn about sure. your, yeah, learn about your introduction to the flute because I, I don't really know too much about your background. Right. Okay. So I am from Tokyo, like you said. Um, I uh, was born into a musician's family. So my my mom is a pianist. My dad is a clarinet player. My sister um, is also a piano player. So when I was growing up, my parents had lots of students, and my sister, who is five years older than me, were who started playing the piano when she was two and a half years old. <laughs> so, you know, when, as, as, as long as I remember when I was three, four, my sister was put to practice like seven hours every day, you know, and because my mom is a pianist, she understands when my sister is really practicing or not really practicing, <laughs> right? So she was having such a hard time. My mom was counting how many times my sister would go to the bathroom because my sister realized bathroom is the only time that she could be alone. <laughs> right, exactly. So um, things like that. So when I was growing up, I always thought about music as something that I should not do. Oh, it's something scary. It's something scary. It's something tough. It's no, 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 no. I, I no, no, no. I don't do that. So um, I didn't until I was 11. And when I was 11 years old, my parents and my sister had a concert together. And, you know, looking back, it wasn't really that big of a concert or anything. But that time, to me, it looked really, really big. Yeah. And on the day of the concert, all of the neighbors came. And then the neighbors were telling me, like, oh, your family is such an amazing, talented family. I'm not included in that, you know? Yeah. And to uh, up until the day of the concert you know they would practice at home and the conversation of the rehearsal is going to be carried over to dinner table and me the 11 year old me don't understand what they are talking about you're left you know, out the exactly they, they, you know it's not even japanese right like <laughs> none, of the, <laughs> none of the you know music language was in japanese i didn't understand what was happening so after that concert i thought you know what to survive in this family i probably have to play a little bit i never i still i refused to be a professional player or anything but i i just wanted to understand the language of music a little bit so that i could sort of be a part of this family so mm -hmm. um i but piano definitely not i did not want to do clarinet i started a little bit with it because my dad because of my dad but um that's when my parents noticed that i had a perfect pitch which was weird, but clarinet, you know, it's not like my, my dad told me, okay, so this is the note of C and then you play, you blow into it and then you get a C. So I did it. And then, you, and then I said something like, well, but this is B flat. It's not C, is it? <laughs> and then they were like, Ugh, you know, and uh, I think, I don't know why I had, you know, a perfect pitch. Probably I was just growing up listening to it. Right. You know, the sound of piano and, you know, what is do and what is me and then what is so, so like to me, it's, it's sort of like uh, ingrained like, in you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So they said, okay, so clarinet is not your thing. Um, my sister, when she was in junior high school, she was in a band and she was playing the flute. So um, the flute was just sitting around the house. So I said, okay, is this shiny silver thing? <laughs> You know, if I blow into this one, do I get the correct C? And then they're like, yep, yep, it will. And it's like, okay, great. That's good enough. Let's do that. It's pretty, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty. So that's, that's seriously how I started. So I never, you know, um, thought about becoming anything with it, really. 
but the great thing about having musicians as parents is one of the great things is that um they knew great teachers yeah so i immediately started studying with this uh, amazing teacher named Miss uh, Akiko Mikami, she's a Japanese lady. And uh, I started going to her lessons and she made it really fun, but she made it really, really challenging. And I really liked it. So since then, I sort of just start practicing a lot. Um, yeah, then I never stopped. <laughs> did your mom bug you about practicing the same way she bugged your sister or did no. she leave you alone yeah she left me alone one because my sister was and my mom was too busy with my sister already and two because she didn't know anything about flute and three I was actually practicing a lot because it was fun for me it was almost like a little child with a sandcastle Right. You know, that kind of thing. You can do that for hours and hours because I, ne I didn't have any pressure to become anything with it, I think. So I, I, in my mind, I'm just going to do this as long as it's fun for me. Um, but is that, I mean, you went on to win, I mean, be one of the youngest people ever to win all of these huge competitions in Japan. Um, you have really made a name for yourself as a, a soloist. Is that a conscious effort that you made or was it just a continuation of you know I'm just going to see what doors open for me and just keep having fun and um or did you kind of make a clear like career path and and make some written out goals for yourself I think I made a career path after I started winning competitions that's when I realized oh I might be not too bad at this you know um I think how it works was um I was practicing, it was fun. And then I was going to this, this weekly lessons. And at one point my teacher said, you know, you should try to get into this high school, this music high school where my sister went. And I was like, really? Okay. So then I do have to practice a little bit more. I have to practice more systematically in order to get into this high school, which I did. And then, uh, so I, now I'm in high school and then my teacher, the same teacher said, well, you should try this competition. So I was like, okay, sure. I practiced. I, I wanted to do my best, but that was, I didn't have an ulterior motive to do. Does that make sense? I, yeah. I just wanted to do my best. Yeah. So I did. And I practiced a lot. I worked and I, but I never thought that I would win. Um, and then after Tokyo, what uh, kind of prompted you to go to school overseas and leave? So I, uh, when I graduated from the university in Tokyo, um, I was wondering what I should do. And then uh, I had a teacher in, in the university. I had a, an amazing teacher. He's my mentor for life. His name is Mr. Paul Meisen, uh, a German teacher uh, who was in Tokyo as a guest professor. So in, in my university. And so I was discussing with him and uh, ultimately I decided to go to Germany to mm -hmm. study with Jean-Claude Girard uh, in Stuttgart. And then, uh, yeah, so I moved from Japan to Berlin, actually. My apartment was in Berlin. I was commuting to Stuttgart for lessons. And then I was also, but I was also coming back to Japan like 10 times a year for concerts. So I was the girl with a suitcase the entire time. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Paul because I mean, you have studied with so many big name artists and, and um, you study with Backstresser and, and Galway too. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't really know that much about Paul and his teaching style and his work. Um, he wasn't as familiar to me, so I was reading up a little bit about him and he's um, so inspirational and such a fascinating teacher. And I know that he's influenced you a lot and, and your teaching style. Um, can you talk a little bit about some really big lessons you learned from him? And I, I think probably something you're going to talk about is his kind of uh, encompassing of the whole musician and the whole person. I can write a book about <laughs> Mr. Meisen. <laughs> so that's how I feel. And then every single student who learned with Mr. Meisen would tell you the same thing. That's how influential he is. He was to all of us and all of us who were lucky enough to study with him. Um, he is not, he was not just a flute teacher who taught me how to play a flute or 
the music. But he was, he was a life teacher. Um, one example that I can give you is that um, I was living in Berlin. So this was after I officially, you know, I was, I was no longer official student of him because I moved to Germany and then he was still in, no, he, he was also back in Germany, but I was studying in Stuttgart. He was in, in, uh, in Munich. One day I had a burnout. I seriously thought about quit playing the flute. I was 24 probably. And I thought I've done everything I wanted to do. I really don't have that much passion for playing the flute and I, I now that I think about it, I, it was I was like legitimately depressed. You know, yeah. a lot of things happened. Anyway, so one night I called Mr. Meisen and said, "Hi, Mr. Meisen, how are you? I'm just calling you to let you know that I'm quitting playing the flute." <laughs> and then he was like, uh, "Okay," and I said, "I remember this." I said. I just don't think I have that much passion in playing the flute as much as you believe that I do. So I'm done. I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm done. And then he said, okay, all right, you know what? It's late. I called him at night. Let's talk again tomorrow. How's that? And I was like, okay, fine. Let's talk again tomorrow. But I, my mind is not going to change, you know, just so you know. And he's like, that's fine. Let's talk tomorrow. Next morning, around 9.30 in the morning, my phone rang. I'm in an apartment in Berlin, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I was my, uh, it was Mr. Meisen's uh, wife, who was Japanese, who is Japanese. And she called me, and it was her super sparkly voice. It's like, hey, Kari, how are you? Good morning, blah, blah, blah. Where are you? And I was like, uh, I'm at home. And he's like, okay, great. You know, my husband and I just happened to be in Berlin. And we just happened to be close to your apartment. And I was wondering if you would let us in. Mr. Meisen and his wife drove from Munich to Berlin overnight. Wow. That's 800 wow. kilometers away. Yeah. It's a long drive. They came. They came in with their son, who was a friend of mine. He used to live in Berlin at that time, too. So they came in and... I was stunned. Mr. Meisen said, okay, let's talk. What's up? And I talked, I talked, cried for like a couple of hours, I think. And he said, you know what, my dear, if you really want to quit, I understand. And don't worry, the relationship between you and I, my family and I, I my family and you, I'm not going to change at all. So that's okay. And then I understand. But I always thought that you're talented, whatever, this and this. But there was one thing that is missing from you that is stopping you from becoming a great artist rather than great musician. He has this clear distinction mm -hmm. between the good flutist, good right. musician, and good artist. Yeah. And he's very much on like, what do you want to be kind of guy said I think you're a good musician but in order for you to become an artist there was something was missing and that something to me was true sadness real you know just experiencing true sadness and true pain and that's what you're experiencing right now so you are actually just set foot to become an artist that's why as a teacher I think it's a shame if you quit now however it's okay if you want to. So I just wanted to let you know that in person. Now we are leaving. Goodbye. He hugged me. His wife is crying. Oh. You know. Who does that yeah. to a student? Yeah. You know? Eventually, after he left, I was stunned. And then I... But then I realized how lucky I am to have a mentor who I respect the most that also cares about me so much or yeah. cares about me, not 
only as a flutist or flute student, but as a person. And yeah, not not many people do that. Rare. You know? Yeah, very rare. Yeah. Place, yeah. Do you think so, that a lot of teachers of um, maybe we in this rush to acquire such a large studio and make a name for ourselves with recruiting and and building a, a big studio of flutists um, lose a little bit of that of that personal touch and I mean how is he able to do that with all of his his flute students and have such care about every single individual yeah I, I think I think he is just definitely I think if you have this all this pressure of getting you know enough students into a studio all this thing uh, would make it difficult to do what Mr. Meisen did, I'm yeah. sure. Um, but it really just comes down to his personality and his character and who he was as a teacher. He, his, his role uh, as a teacher that he decided, you know, I, I know, and then it's not only to me. I don't know how many how many miles he drove for other for students. I have no idea. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> but that's but that's not only the you know that, but he has done so many things that it's absolutely time consuming, absolutely inconvenient. He had never yelled at us, he had never do any of that, you know. But he's always he's very tough, he's very strict, but not in in a like up down way you know like he right. wasn't that at all and the care that he has for his students were like oof. yeah incredible how does that influence your own teaching without mr meisen i don't think i would be doing what i do with music beyond in congo yeah what i noticed when when i was studying with him this was in university there are you know some student i was one of those the winning team you know I was like going to a competitions and then I'm doing well in a competition so and so there are other students who are not yet a winning team or they are amazing in certain things but competition was just not their thing you know which happens all the time how he brought out how Mr. Meisen brought out the absolute best from everybody was incredible and then how he how fair he was to each student, how encouraging he was to each one of us, how, uh, yeah, it was just absolutely incredible. And that's when I, that's where I learned that music, playing the music is a, is a battle against yourself, not against anybody else. Right. You know? Yeah. So, and that was very much of his teaching style. And uh, through that, certain people became a competition winner, like me, or some people became a brilliant teacher, some people became, uh, you know, whatever, but they found oh, their own cool. life path through music, through flute. Some of them probably don't even play the flute anymore, but that doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think he sort of encouraged them to become who they want to be and yeah. what they're good at so that's definitely what i try to do with music beyond and uh, yeah he did, mr martin did that for me and all the other people that he studied, uh, that he studied with him yeah you also have a really uh, impressive discography uh, you have a lot of recordings mm -hmm. out there <laughs> i believe about eight albums that you released mm -hmm. um I, you're the first flutist to record the bach cello suites too right um, I think I think uh, Nicolet did it uh, 30, 40 years ago, probably. Um, yeah. But that it was a record, and then I don't think it made it to a CD. So yeah, as a CD, probably yeah. Um, what was the? Can you talk about the inception of that project and then how the recordings went? Sure. So um, I was speaking with my producer. The, the, the recording producer and we were discussing about what to do as my debut album that was the first album and uh, he was we were just discussing and what I said was like I do not want to do like uh, the, the famous flute pieces of blah 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 that kind of thing I just did not want to do that as a as an as an, a debut thing and then he was like okay that's that's I think that's fine I think that's a good thing um 
he said like what do you what is your general uh, feeling about uh, arrange arrangement like arranged music not you know not originally for flute and I said well it's depend really depending on the arrangement um you know for example I I know the cello suite on flute thing like I've seen it in music I think that's brilliant but and then he was like, hey, wait a moment, wait a moment, what did you say? And said, well, if you tell a sweet for example, it is a good thing, I think. And I was like, that's it. And then I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> you're on. I guess that's what's happening. But okay, I have to talk to my teacher about this. Yeah. I was 19. Eh? So, uh, and so I called Mr. Meisen, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> after the meeting <laughs> and it's like okay Mr. Meisen here's the thing looks like I'll be recording cello suite <laughs> and then he was like oh dear and it's like yeah what do you think and it's like let me think about this overnight I'll call you tomorrow like, okay fair enough fine next morning he called me back he said okay so when is this recording he said well it's in three months from now he's like all right come to my lesson today and since that moment on for the first two months all I did was long tone. Oh. All I was put to, all I was allowed to do was long tone. Wow. <laughs> yep. Like he said like exercise and right. patience too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He said, you know, for, for you, I know that like musically speaking, you wouldn't have a problem. We can talk about music. We can do this. That's, yeah. you know, that's not going to be a problem. But if you're going to do cello suite, then you need to get the right sound for it. Yeah. And that takes more time. So that's what we are doing. Which I think you achieved. I mean, listening to your recordings. Yeah, it's absolutely impressive how you oh, thank you. and the colors and it's spot on. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, it definitely paid off. I'm really happy yeah. about it. And, uh, but uh, woof, that was tough. Huh? <laughs> um, and you've talked a lot about all these accomplishments and, and how competitions were easy for you. Um, just from the outside perspective, it looks like your career has been a lot of waves of success to the top. Uh, have there been any big bumps in the road or any huge challenges that made you um, second guess your talents. I mean, I know you, you said you were con contemplating quitting, but what kind of brought that on for you? Okay, first of all, competition was never easy for me. The, the first couple, yes, was probably because I didn't have any expectations. But then after that, I started getting all these expectations from outside. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh my God, Kauri is going to come to this competition. It means that she's going to take all the money again that kind of thing. People right. say that so easily. People say that so casually. And some people might even say that as a compliment. But that was a huge pressure for me, huge. And I was crying like every time when I go when I had to go to a competition, I, I, every time I cried. And yeah. Um, so yes, in the last competition I did in Japan, and then I won. I was so happy, not because I won, but because this is it. I don't need to do any of this stuff anymore. Yeah. So it was a torture all through, you know. You lost I, all joy for you through that process. Yeah, exactly. So it was, it was, it was really tough. Um, for this time where I decided to quit uh, playing the flute was um, shortly before that. I went on a diplomatic mission through the Japanese embassy to have a uh, to, to play concerts and teach local musicians in 10 countries in uh, Central and South America so that tour was just spectacular it was amazing I was you know playing the concerts was great but like meeting with these local musicians who are plumbers, who are whatever, or who are little girls, you know, who, are, who have this horrible flute that you can hardly make a sound out of, yeah. even I couldn't make a sound of, you know, but they're just playing with them and whatever. So I, I had such an amazing time. I came back to Berlin. And I just felt like, that was that was like too high of a time, I think. And then I came back back to reality where yes, sure, I'm playing a lot of concerts or whatever, but it's not like I can play all the music that I want to play. Yeah. 
they always ask me to play common fantasy. I don't like common fantasy, but I'm good at it. That's the problem. So, <laughs> you know, I can play it and people like me to play common fantasy, but I don't want to play common fantasy, you know, things like that. And then um, my life, where is it going? What's the meaning of all this? You know, I think I, I was young and um, yeah, I just felt like I had this amazing tour. I should just leave on the high note. I thought that was the highest note and that I could hit, you know? Well, yeah, and, and you've, uh, I mean, I'm sure Music Beyond was a perfect outlet for you, kind of giving you a, a sense of purpose too. Um, for anybody that doesn't really know too much about it, um, we here at FCNY do, we've supported uh, you and Music yeah. Beyond for, for a while now. Um, we're from the beginning, yeah. from the beginning, yeah. from the very beginning, yeah. <laughs> Um, so you're the founder and the president, CEO. You started Music Beyond, uh, I think, in the summer of 2014, um, running. That's right. Yep. Yeah, running this organization that brings free classical music education to women in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, and you're empowering them to find their voice through music. Um, can you talk about this project? Why this project, and why the Democratic Republic of Congo? So, uh, yes, yeah, so Music Beyond, I, I set up a small organization called Music Beyond six years ago. And the whole idea is to sort of use the uh, power of music to, to empower and transform people's lives in, you know, in an African country called the Democratic Republic of the Congo through education, mentorship, collaborations, performance opportunities, so on and so um, I first heard about, so there are two things that happened. The first thing was, I heard about this orchestra in the middle of Africa called the Kimbangi Symphony Orchestra. It's in Kinshasa, which is the capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. There are 200 members in orchestra. In the middle of Africa, they're playing Beethoven. And I saw a documentary film about them and I thought it was just incredible you know and half of them have to make their own instrument you know it's 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 crazy like congo is is one of the poorest countries on earth where you know majority of people are forced to live under two dollars a day in the last 30 years or so five hundred thousand people were killed three hundred thousand women are raped it's called the rape capital of the world because they use rape as a weapon of war so they have wars conflicts corruptions all these things right after another. It is a tough country to be in and they're still doing it. So I thought it was just incredible. I contacted the Japanese embassy that time to see using my previous experience with this diplomatic mission in, in South America, I thought maybe I could do something like that, but only in Congo this time. Uh, they were interested, but ultimately there was no money. So, you know, couldn't do anything, um, but I, contacted the orchestra, I kept in touch with the orchestra. They wanted me to come and teach the musicians, or the woodwind musicians, because they've never had any teachers. So I was thinking about that. And that was in my back of my mind. And then um, January, 2014, I was invited to speak at one of the uh, uh, conference, like multi-professional conference at the uh, Columbia University. And there, I met other speakers who were incredibly accomplished business consultants, the army, the ad agencies, the, all these different uh, uh, profession uh, people. Majority of them were talking about how they were using their expertise, knowledge, and talent to contribute to the world. Whereas my prepared speech was me, yeah. you know? <laughs> my accomplishments and whatever. That's, that came as a huge shock to me, huge. You know, if, if people in the, in, the, in the world of business or people in the world of advertisement, we tend to think of them as money chaser, whatever this and this. If they can do it, we the musicians who are supposed to be bringing joy and happiness to people, we yeah. should be able to do that outside of conventional concert halls or recording studio or wherever or outside of people that can afford this yeah to be honest with you you know so that conference was a huge wake-up call to me shortly after that that conference 
my experience, my past experience was Mr. Meisen, how much he helped me as a person. And this orchestra story that I've seen mm -hmm. all sort of just clicked. And I said, you know what? I was waiting for this perfect opportunity where everything is, is completely set on the silver platter to go to Congo. But you know what? I'm just going to go. So I did. So yeah. I, I, was, uh, I, I, I started with a, with a former student of mine. So my former uh, my student at that time, she was like, Kauri, that sounds amazing. I want to be in. So we both went there. The two of us went there and we spent 10 days and we had a great feeling about it. We came back and uh incorporated as a as, as a non-profit organization but she ended up leaving shortly after so uh it's basically since then it's me but yeah um yeah can you talk about and you visited there um and you go back often um can you talk about the women that you do work with and sure a little bit of their story i know that a lot of them have gone on to be educators and leaders in their community Right. So I, I first started, we, we first started going there um, to teach the woodwind musicians who are all 98% men. So we were working with men first. And then uh, soon after, or a few years later, uh, we decided to, to do something with women. And then uh, we formed this, this uh, all-female chamber ensemble, which is the first one in the Congo. Yep. And these ladies went through so much. There are mothers with four children. There are mother that who had to give away her child because she couldn't afford to keep her. You know, after her husband left her, she could not afford to keep her. She doesn't have an education. She hasn't she hasn't gone to elementary school. She's she doesn't have an education, so she doesn't have any means to make money. So therefore she had to give away her own child. That happens far too often in, in Congo. That's our break. People, yeah. And people went through just unimaginable pain. One of the ladies that I, you know, would like to share a story of is her name is Julie. She was a really grumpy woman. When I first <laughs> met her, she's never smiled, never. And she is a violin player, but who was painful violin player, right? Um, it was, it was, it was bad. But then, for some reason, she's always there. I never force anybody to be there. I said, "This is completely free. If you want to come, you come. If you don't, you don't. That's fine. I'm just here. I'm gonna park myself here. So, <laughs> you know, you do whatever you want to do." That's sort of my stance. I never want to be one of those foreigners who fly in from New York to tell them the woman should be this or that in, right. in Congo, you know. So I just do that. And then, but she's always there. She's always grumpy. And whatever that I suggest, she doesn't seem to be that happy about it either, <laughs> you know. So I really don't know why she's there. But I asked my translator, uh, who is a Congolese guy, I said, so what's up with Julie? And it's like, well, okay, so Julie went through a lot. This, it's, she had a really tough life. If she's here now, it means that she's enjoying it. So just let her be here. So it's like, fine, great, all right. So I started working with her. So her grumpiness did not discourage me anymore. Mm -hmm. So like I kept on pushing her, I kept on working with her. And then soon she started becoming really really good violinist like really the transformation she made from where she came from versus where she you know became was just incredible now other women noticed that right mm -hmm. notice that oh my god julie can do this so now julie started becoming more of a respected member of this ensemble she started as one of the least best <laughs> you know yeah. player and then now she's you know so now she started actually making a you know an advice to other musicians or whatever like she started and she started laughing she started smiling and she started talking more it was incredible and then one day she came to me and she said power you know what i had been always making juice so but 
I never thought my juice was good enough. So what I did was like I made the juice and I gave it to my neighbor in exchange for something else. That also people do that a lot. So it's like, I give you this juice. I, you know, I made orange juice. I give you three bottles of orange juice. Can you please fix my uh, whatever, right. you know, fridge or anything, right? Or can you give me three potatoes? Like that's sort of an exchange. She has been doing that. But then she said, you know, I realized that I was a really, I knew I was a really bad violin player, but I could actually become better at it. Even my husband noticed that, wow. you know, I sound better. Compared to the violin, juice was much better to begin with. So I decided to invest in bottles and she created like her own label and brought it to the market and sold it for the first time. So now, 40 something year old woman made her own money for the first time. She, it's, it's not just the money, it's the, the courage that, that she has to have to go to the market to claim her spot, which is not difficult in Kinshasa, in, in Congo, it's, it's, it's a war zone really, you know? Yeah. But you, have to, you have to be really strong, especially as a woman, you go there alone, you claim your spot, you park yourself there, you put your product in front of her, and then try to get the customer, and they all try to huggle, you know? So you, you still have to like say like, nope, this is my price, you know, whatever you buy it or you don't. Yeah. She did that. To me, that is the reason why Music Beyond exists. Music Beyond is not about bringing out the next best musical talent, you know, classical music talent from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's more about using music to gain a little bit of a self-confidence because honestly a little bit of a self-confidence and a little bit of a cheerleading mm -hmm. and a lot of determination can do so much to people to everyone yeah, you know sure. and then i think the you and i voice. you and i had that that's why we are who we are now right like we had we, it's thanks to all this mentor we had or the family members or whoever or friends whoever that we had who pushed us who who gave us this confidence that we needed to do what we do you know and then that confidence brought a little bit of a success and that little bit of a success brought more challenges but also more confidence and more determination and you just keep on doing that that's how we grow and for Julie, she just didn't have that chance until she was mid 40 in her mid 40s. Yeah. And she got it. And she unfortunately passed away this year. All of a sudden, died. So uh, I, I was devastated. Every older woman was were, were devastated, but she will her story will forever be ingrained to the philosophy of music beyond and uh, yeah that's how I feel. Well I'm, I feel very honored and it's uh, really special that you shared her story with us and that's fantastic. Um, what are your plans for staying engaged with these women during these tough times um, with COVID and you know what are your plans for the future with the organization? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, since since the COVID, we had to be very creative to find ways to keep the workshop online, which was a great challenge with a, a country where there's no electricity. Okay. So, <laughs> but we somehow, you know, made it happen step by step. And uh, so we are doing this uh, weekly workshop now, which uh, has been you know, which has been successful, you know, so far. Uh, in the end of November, they will, we are doing Music Beyond this, is, is co-hosting this event called Art of Hope, where we are uh, showcasing different musical talent from Congo. Mm -hmm. um, not just the classical music, but singer songwriter or poet or whoever, or, you know. Um, so these ladies will be showcased there. Also during this Art of Hope, we are, um, hosting some webinars 
and these ladies actually are going to be the panelists in the um, the webinars about women's empowerment through the arts. So the target audience, exactly, the target audience is, is the, the fellow Congolese women who are in a creative industry or who are trying to be, trying to stay in a creative industry or even men who don't understand the why, you know, part. So uh, it's now that they are becoming to be uh, a people who not only empower their own communities or their own family members or their neighbors, but they can through, you know, through the, 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 the magic of, of internet, um, they can actually send that message to to greater audience and then I'm, I'm really happy about it and they're actually keen to do that which is amazing which wouldn't have happened just a couple of years ago yeah like a few years ago they would be like no no way uh -uh, <laughs> like we have nothing to say we don't right. know so and now they're like yeah let's do it that sounds great so that's great we have you know partnered with the world food program we have partnered with a with a, a UN woman it's all this amazing UN agencies are, you know, uh, helping the woman as well. Yeah. Same as the Japanese embassy, same as the American embassy in Congo. So we are a very small organization. But um, after six years of, of working and trying to send a message, uh, people in Congo, international communities in Congo are beginning to notice what we do as a music beyond and the amazing quality of these women and men uh, in, in this music music community. Um, you know, they're beginning to notice them. And uh, so I'm very excited where this is going. Um, mm -hmm. I plan to music beyond plans to stay in the Congo for, for a very, very long time. Right. with these ladies and also like in, in you know in, uh, in in the future we want to bring more of we want to do more of this art of hope type of thing where we want to create a platform to support nurture and celebrate the create creative talent of Congo at large like in, does that make sense you know yeah. like not yeah just classical music but other type of music or the painters or the 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 photographers or you know because there are so many of them there are so many of them they just don't have they don't have to do the, the right platform to right, an outlet. thrive yeah. right so we can sort of create that that's the next step for music beyond i think that's exciting yeah yeah, Did it work. Um, <laughs> I wanted to, to go over a little bit of those logistics, though, too, of um, what is it like juggling, you know, having a nonprofit and doing the business side of things while also taking care of your students and um, taking care of your own life, your own practicing and performing. Uh, what is it like to juggle all of that? Not easy. <laughs> but <laughs> but um i think uh thankfully i'm doing everything that i feel incredibly passionate about thankfully i'm doing something that i absolutely believe in with yeah. all my heart so um music beyond takes most of my time to be honest with you like a lot of my time because again it is a small organization i'm wearing so many different hats to to, to keep this uh, afloat so and have you had a, a uh, to help you with with how to run a nonprofit, or is this a lot of stuff that you've taught yourself it's it's basically a lot of stuff that i taught myself however i do you know i do have great advisors sure. they you know so they are they are my mentors now you know for, for music beyond and so whenever i have a problem i would you know i can i can call them and to get a meeting in you know, to be, because these are like highly, highly accomplished people. So I don't right. really bug them for every single thing, but yeah. you know, uh, in terms of the directions that I should take or the music beyond should, you know, should, should do or should not do. Um, I feel lucky to have that um, 
to make a big decision than if I needed some somebody, there are people that I can rely on. So that's that's great. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of smaller, more mundane, day-to-day, time-consuming stuff <laughs> are the one that, I, you know, I just have to take care of. So I do. Um, right now, I have an amazing volunteer girl. Oh, my God, she's amazing. <laughs> so I feel really lucky. Um, let's hope she's going to stay for a very long time. <laughs> Shout out to you, Alison. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, but then, you know, so, but it's, it's really nice actually to, to work on this music beyond stuff. And then I teach this amazing student in New York or Japan or, you know, and then I get inspired by them, I think. And then I practice and then those, you know, that my students inspire me to practice for me. I think everything that I do and every one that I do. And feeding into each other. Yeah. Exactly. And then they all inspire each other. So I, you know, I, yeah, time wise, yes, it's not fun, but right. you know, at the end of the day, of course, some days I feel like, why am I doing this? But, um, majority of the time I'm, 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 I, I feel grateful that I am in a position where I can do this, you know? Right. Yeah. Or oh, I, I found that, calling or whatever you call it I think I'm lucky that I could find it is it you know this is the worst decision I always say this is the worst decision I made financially this is the best decision I made as a human being as a flutist uh, you know so do you have any advice for people that are kind of hunting and searching for their calling and are not quite sure what that is yet If you're a musician, I'm guessing a lot of, you know, the, the, the Most listeners. Of our listeners help, yeah. yeah. I want you to first realize that you have a bigger power than you believe you do, I think. I've seen this firsthand what music, uh, what music can do to people. The power of music, blah, blah. Some people hate that right. word because it's, ah, oh, no, it's not really blah, blah. I'm not talking about you. I'm not saying that we are great. I'm saying that music is great, right? Like music does change people. We actually have the power to bring music to life. That's only our job, you know, especially classical music folks. It's just, you know, somebody else wrote the music. Right. You know, like our we are decoder, right? Like we are basically, you know, translator. We we yeah, we we are, we are interpreter. We are translator. So we have we have a responsibility with that too. I think you know we have to. Without the translation, a lot of people cannot get the music. That can change people, right? Yeah. So whether we are performing or whether we are teaching. We are we are doing service to music that can be significant to a lot of people that you don't know that needs that the most. So if you just have that in your mind and if you find something that you feel passionate about, just go for it. But I think it's not about you, it's about the music. That's one. Yeah. And, you know, to if you find something that you feel passionate about, whether if it's teaching or whether if it's performing, whether it's whatever, then just, just do it. Don't, we can always find a thousand reasons not to do something. Always. We are very good at that as human beings, I think. Uh, am I, think I, with, I, I think with the pandemic happening, it kind of highlighted for people how, you know, even with all the excuses gone, um, if you're still not passionate about getting something done and you still you have all this time on your hands, uh, mind you, right. it's a very stressful time, but, um, but there, you know, if you're not passionate about getting it done or you don't want to, even with time, and you still won't do it. <laughs> so Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, right, so it's, we can always find <clears throat> a reason not to do something. Yeah. But don't, I mean, don't do anything crazy. But then again, I'm the one who went to Congo. So like for right. a lot of, you know, <laughs> people book that is like, you know, in 2014, yeah. when there was a huge Ebola epidemic there. Wow. 
so that's that's when I went my parents cried obviously poor thing but um you know fearless <laughs> but it, it all worked out if yeah. you have thousand percent belief in it but that's something that you need to you know ask yourself it, if you're going to do something crazy if you're about to do something crazy you better be sure that that's something that you want to do for a, in, in the long haul not just like whoops nope sorry yeah I didn't mean that you right. know that's not good but uh yeah is that even an advice I don't know uh, yeah I, I think it is it. yeah well so. thank you so much this was extremely Oops. insightful um again very inspiring not to overuse that word but truly it is um and it's great to see you doing something a lot of people talk about giving back um, and you're really, really doing it in a really impactful way. So thank you for your work. Um, keep up the good work and thank you for joining you. today and for coming on here to talk more about yourself. It's been great getting to know you. Of course, it was, it was wonderful to, to talk with you, Katie. So thank you so much. Very welcome. Bye. Bye.